Secretary Clinton, welcome to the Daily Social Distancing Show. <laughs> well, I'm social distancing in my house, and it's great to talk to you today, too. Genuinely, a lot of the time I find myself wondering just, like, what you're doing and where you are as a human being. Because I know if I was in your position, I would spend most of my time tweeting, I told you so, and then I would be like, I would walk around the streets just looking at people saying, it could have been me, it could have been me. So what, like, what do you do? I genuinely would like to know, what do you do? Oh, uh, well, you know, before the lockdown, I was doing all of that. I mean, I, you know, there's probably video. <laughs> <laughs> you should go find it or maybe I'll help you. Uh, you know, for the last, what, how many months? I've been at home yeah, since three months, uh, yeah. in March, like everybody else. Um, and I've done a lot of uh, walking in the woods, my, one of my favorite things to do. I've done a lot of reading and some writing. Uh, this was the big year that we were going to be celebrating the 100th anniversary of American women uh, finally getting the right to vote and working to support the groups that um, I help support through my organization, Onward Together. And then I get to spend time with my grandchildren, which I have to say is the biggest silver lining, Trevor, that you can imagine during this very uh, difficult time. So, you know, we're, I, I don't know what I do all day, but I'm exhausted every night. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's everyone in Corona. We're all, we're all tired and we don't, we don't really know why. Um, I, I do know that you've been really active in, in, you know, in having your voice heard. One of the biggest things you've been passionate about is voting. It seems like America's on an ominous path to a November date when there's going to be a lot of questions in and around the election. Donald Trump is vehemently against mail-in voting. What do you make of this and what do you think the path should be to getting people the easiest access to casting their votes? Republicans have uh, two prongs to their strategy to try to win. The first is try to prevent as many people who they think won't vote for them from voting. So, you know, make the lines really long uh, where young people vote or African Americans vote uh, or Hispanics vote. Uh, try to make uh, vote by mail as difficult as possible. Uh, claim it's fraudulent when indeed it's not. In fact, that's how Donald Trump votes and everybody who uh, knows about vote by mail understands that. And so I've been working with a group called Democracy Docket, led by uh, the lawyer Mark Elias, to help support the lawsuits that are being brought around the country, just to make the vote available, you know, to make it clear that, look, let's have a fair election. And that means let as many people who are eligible citizens uh, to go vote. Are you, are you at all concerned about uh, irregularities in voting or fraud. I mean, for instance, we saw the case in New Jersey, I, I think it was a few weeks ago now, where ironically it was some, a councilman who I think was, um, was changing the votes for, in, in Republicans' favor. Is there a part of you that, that is worried that Donald Trump would be able to use any of those stories to try and undermine the entire election and say, you see, there's that one and there's that one. I don't think we should trust this election at all because it says that I've lost. Well, I think it is um, a fair point to raise as to whether or not, if he loses, um, he's going to go quietly or not. Uh, and we have to be ready for that. But there have been so many uh, academic studies and other analyses which point out that it's just a, uh, it's a, it's an inaccurate, fraudulent claim. There isn't that problem. All the games that are played and all of the photo IDs and any kind of restriction that can be imposed to try to keep the vote down in places that aren't going to vote for Republicans, uh, that's the real danger to the integrity of our election. That combined with misinformation and disinformation and all of the online uh, shenanigans that we saw in 2016. So uh, I'm, look, I want a fair election. If people get to vote and they for whatever reason, vote you know, for Donald Trump. Okay, we'll accept it, not happily. But I don't think that's what will happen because I think the more people who can actually get to the polls, whether by mail or in person mm -hmm. and get their votes counted, then we are going to have the kind of election we should have. And then uh, it'll be a win both in the popular vote and in the electoral college. You, um are the star and subject of a docu-series on Hulu. And for many people, I think maybe even myself included, I saw a side of you that was refreshing and different. And for lack of a better term, you had a swag about you that not many people knew you had, you know? 
do you feel more free or is that is that just captured well in the documentary is there a part of you that goes like you know what i'm free screw screw whatever yeah there is there's really a big part of that and 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 the documentary um you know i was interviewed for 35 hours and wow I, yeah I, and my feeling once i agreed to do the project uh was you know this is it i i you know i'm not running for anything i'm gonna just you know say it like it is the best i can um and a lot of people have said what you've said my gosh i never saw that side of her or whatever and so you know i i know that the the pressures of being in public life and being misunderstood and being you know kind of subjected to the attacks and the criticism mm -hmm. i i know that it probably made me a little less available and open um and probably a little hunkered down, if you will. And my life is a little bit like a Rorschach test where, you know, people who are comfortable with women seeking and holding power, uh, being outspoken, you know, see it and think, oh my gosh, well, yeah, of course. And then people who aren't, maybe they'll, you know, begin to, you know, think differently about that. And many women have said that they've said, Hillary Clinton got further and did more than I ever dared to think was possible. If there's, if there's another Hillary out there who's running and beginning her journey, what would you warn her about or tell her to try and look out for to just give her a little advantage in a world where she desperately needs it? You will be criticized no matter what you do. Um, and so take criticism seriously because sometimes your critics actually can teach you something. But don't take it personally. Don't let it eat away at you. Don't let it knock you down and keep you down. The women who I admire that, you know, Chelsea and I wrote that book about gutsy women are women mm -hmm. who are not just in it for themselves. Whatever it is that motivates you, have something bigger than yourself that is going to get you up in the morning and keep going because it can be brutal out there. <laughs> it can be <laughs> incredibly difficult. You can be called a nasty woman for heaven's sakes. Um, so what you've got to do is just believe, not just in yourself alone, but in what you're trying to do for others. And that will keep you motivated no matter what. Let me ask you this question is, are you now ready to wear a mask now that Donald Trump has finally put one on? I'm assuming you just haven't been wearing one waiting for this moment. Yeah, no, I mean, I've actually been wearing one and uh, I, I think, you know, better late than never, I guess. Uh, my daughter had a great tweet, which I retweeted, where she said, look, I'm not being sarcastic. If he would sell masks with his face on him, and go ahead and make the money, at least it would send a good message. So now that he has been seen once in a mask, maybe uh, those people who still, you know, take their cues from him will similarly start wearing masks because we're in a desperate situation again, Trevor. I mean, look, I mean, Florida, if it were an individual country right now, would have the fourth highest rate in the world after the overall US and Brazil, mm -hmm. India. So. Uh, you know, we are a long way from getting this um, under control. But there's no denying that every country, once they got a, an idea of what the coronavirus was, handled it differently. When you look back at the way America handled it, once people understood how severe this was, where do you think President Trump went wrong? Or where do you think a, a, a good president would have done something differently? Well, I, I think you have to start with um, uh, President Trump's uh, total hostility towards science, evidence, facts, logic, reason. He is a showman. He is a reality TV star. He likes to try to bend reality to suit his own uh, preferences. And he clearly started hearing about this back in January through intelligence briefings that he either read or he didn't read. But even before that, he had disbanded the uh, unit within the National Security Council that would try to get ahead of and follow uh, the development of pandemics abroad. He had really made it clear that he was more interested in the optics than the facts when the uh, virus first hit. And he kept saying, you know, we have 15 cases, it'll be over soon. So you, you've got to begin and end with his total um, lack of leadership, his indifference toward what this virus has cost us, not only in lives, but in jobs and livelihoods. And then now, of course, 
He doesn't want to hear from our leading infectious disease experts like Dr. Fauci. He doesn't want to hold uh, the, even the sham of the meetings that he used to hold to try to talk about it. He's, he's hoping that it either goes away or it leaves our attention span so that he can get back to you know, pretending to be president. You, you, you very rightfully call him a showman. I mean, that's something we all acknowledge. Donald Trump has an uncanny ability to put on a show and just really, uh, you know, suck all of the attention that the media wants to give him. There has to be a part of you that, that you know, I guess is, is, is a little angry at that because, I mean, when you're running for president, a lot of it in America specifically is about putting on the show. Do you, do you sometimes wish there was a, like a, like a, a test that you'd have to write? Is there some, cause you're sitting at home and you have so many of these answers and you've studied so hard, but really you got, you, you got beaten by a showman who just knew how to win the ratings. How do you feel about that when you see what America is going through now? Well, it breaks my heart um, because I tried to warn people um, during the campaign that he was not fit for the office. He wasn't prepared for the office that his, uh, his, his appeals to the basest instincts among us was really setting us up for even more divisiveness. And then I saw it literally from the inauguration forward. Um, I take no pleasure in that because look, I, I wanna root for America. I wanna root for anybody who's our president. It's just hard to see what he's done to the office, his undermining of our institutions, his, his absolute disregard for the rule of law. And I think you're right that it is, it's painful uh, for me, um, but I think for many Americans who expected better, uh, even people who voted for him, uh, expected him to rise to the job. And increasingly that has become, you know, just impossible to expect any longer. I have to ask you about Roger Stone. Help me understand, A, why do presidents or should presidents have the power to pardon anybody, especially someone who's related to them in a case? And secondly, what precedent could Trump be setting for America slash do you think it's going to be a precedent where a president says, I will pardon anybody who protects me by not snitching? Well, I think you just summed up why Roger Stone was pardoned. I mean, he basically threatened Trump. You know, he basically said, I sure don't want to go to jail and I sure have a lot more to say. And boy, I just wish there'd be somebody who could stop me from having to go to jail. And guess what? You know, Trump intervened. This is an extension of the total disregard for the rule of law. The pardon power is supposed to be used for compassionate purposes, um, to try to right wrongs, to try to make sure that people are not... Uh, being punished unfairly or have been punished enough. And in this case, it's a continuation of the cover-up because the one thing that Trump is fearful of uh, when it comes to his being president is that finally we will see how illegitimate his victory actually was and how he was involved in uh, the uh, seeking of foreign help and then the utilization of it and how Roger Stone was critical to that. But you know, unless Trump is defeated at the polls in November, we will never really know everything there is to know about this really deep, ongoing uh, uh, dismantling of institutions and undermining the rule of law and the original sin of uh, the way that he actually um, won the election. So Roger Stone was in the middle of it all. And uh, that's why, you know, Trump had to cover it up. Well, Secretary Clinton, thank you so much for taking the time today. Um, I hope you enjoy the gardening, your walks in the woods, and hopefully you'll be back out in the streets saying I told you so sooner than later. I look forward to that, Trevor. And stay healthy and stay safe yourself. Will do. Thank you very much. <laughs>